<laughs> Approximately a year ago, I received my first fan request, which was to comment on the casting of Chris Evans as Captain America. Ever since, I have received countless requests to review the Chris Evans film, Push. This is a lost account of that review. Oh, what the hell just happened? I sat down to watch a movie and now this. The last 10 minutes have been wiped clean from your memory. Two years ago, you watched a very forgettable film, and the same thing happened. Now the fans have asked you to review the same film. Do not watch this movie. All information you need to know to review it is within this notebook, which I have left in plain sight. P.S. The ultimate challenge is just a few days away. uncertainty, where movie theaters are plagued by remakes and sequels, in a world where big budget movies can still suck, in this world we have the Blockbuster Buster. Greetings fanboys and fangirls, I'm Erod and I'm the Blockbuster Buster. I'm a little freaked out over my recent memory loss, so I'm hiding out in my secret workshop. For now, let me post you guys a query. What's worse than a crappy remake, a crappy sequel, or a crappy adaptation? A CRAPPY WANNABE! In a pathetic attempt to capitalize on the comic book movie boom, Summit Entertainment, the production company that brought us Twilight, teamed up with DC Wildstorm to create their own superhero franchise called Push. And in an effort to fool the comic book readers, I mean promote their movie, Summit published a Push comic book. And I'm sure this wasn't done with any intention of making it seem like Push was an established comic book series. You know, I've never actually seen the Push comic or even read it, so I looked up and wrote down the fresh and original plot to the Push comic book here in my handy dandy memory book. Here it goes. During World War II, the Nazis experiment to create a super soldier. The experiments inadvertently create a whole new race of super-powered people that are persecuted into hiding. A division of the government is sanctioned to hunt down and kill all the superhumans. Our hero, Nick, looks to avenge his dead father. Hmm, something about this seems very familiar. It's like I've seen this movie before somewhere. So our movie begins with a flashback, as our hero, a 10 year old boy named Nick, is on the run with his father, who has telekinetic abilities. The evil super people killing division is on its way to kill Nick's father. So he has no choice but to hide Nick, but not before giving him some invaluable advice. With great power comes great responsibility. The leader of the division shows up, Carver, played by Jamon Honsu. Awesome! He looks like he's about to do something badass! What? They're not gonna show us what's happening in the room? <sighs> well, I guess they're saving the reveal of his super badass abilities until the end of the movie. Which is okay. Well, let's at least look at the aftermath of the fight so we can piece together- WHAT?! Ugh, fuck it. So we cut to the opening credit sequence where the disembodied voice of a little girl tells us the backstory. Man, if there was only a storytelling medium that told stories visually as opposed to using boring narration. But alas, that is only a madman's dream. The anonymous little girl tells us that there are nine different classes of super people. There are movers, who move things, pushers, who push thoughts, watchers, who- Wait a minute! I think I know who they stole these names from! 
The Punisher punishes, the Watcher watches, the Shocker shocks, and the Leader. So we cut the present date where we meet the grown-up Nick. Yes, it's Chris Evans, and I promise not to make any jokes at the expense of his acting until after I see the Captain America movie. Nick is a mover. That means he moves things. He uses his amazing powers to cheat at street gambling. Really? Well, I guess he has to keep a low profile so he's not caught and killed by the Division, and he has to make ends meet. What a schmuck. Well, at least the Division won't find him. Just say there, Nick. What a schmuck. According to the Division agents, they are there looking for information on a super that got away. You see, they caught this pusher named Kira, and they gave her this drug that enhanced her powers. And she used her enhanced powers to engineer an escape. And wait a minute! WTF mofo, was it the Division's purpose to hunt down and kill all the supers? So what was the purpose of enhancing this girl's powers? And if they were gonna do that, why didn't they take the necessary precautions? This doesn't make a lick of sense. Ah, screw it. Let's just see how Nick escapes from the Division goons. I know where you are now. They just left. What incompetent asshole runs this division anyway? This is what I want you to do. Steal his toothbrush. So after the agents leave, Nick gets a phone call from a very powerful watcher that can predict everything that is happening in his apartment. And she is on her way to see him. Oh man, I'm sorry. I have no jokes for this scene and I did promise not to make fun of Chris Evans. All right, let's meet this ultra badass future predicting watcher. <laughs> I'm like totally a superhero and shit. <laughs> and I can like predict the future and I like keep all my predictions in my sticker book. Oh, okay, okay, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna laugh that much this time. I promise. Wait a minute. So this pint-sized soothsayer who looks like a thrift store exploded on her is Cassie. She claims that one of her visions led her to Nick, and if they work together, Nick will help her find her mother in a suitcase full of money. And what does she use as evidence of this vision? A picture she drew. Let me guess, Nick is gonna go along with this in spite of having no motivation to do so. You really are so predictable. Meanwhile, the Division captures Kira very easily, but she begins to engineer her escape by pushing subliminal messages into their heads. So you're telling me that a government division that does nothing but capture and kill superpowered people doesn't have a countermeasure for this kind of attack? I'm surrounded by idiots. Long story short, she makes one of the agents shoot the other, and then takes on the second one hand to hand. What? When did she learn to fight like Jason Bourne? What the hell was in that super soldier serum they injected her with? All right, don't need to know, I'm good. So Nick actually shows some brains and turns down Cassie when they are suddenly attacked by a superpowered street gang named, and I kid you not, the Pops. There's Pop Girl, Pop Daddy, and um, Poppin' Fresh, I guess? I don't know. The Sonic Screamers don't finish off Nick because Pop Girl has a vision in which they kill Nick and never find the girl that they're looking for in the infamous case. So they chased him and tried to kill him even though they needed him to find Kira. <laughs> you dumb bastard. So we cut to some place that was never established where we find the injured Nick and it's the same flashback again. With great power. But then this person shows up, heals Nick, and then goes away. Who the hell was that? On whose side is she on? And why did she heal Nick? Stop asking perfectly logical questions, you foolish fool! So get this, Nick agrees to help Cassie find her mom in the MacGuffin case, even though he was almost just murdered, because... Someday, a girl is gonna give you a flower. You got that flower, and you have to help her, Nick. Um. So Cassie predicts that the Division is using an olive to find Kira. Not an olive, it's a bead. But it looks like a... Yeah, it's a bead. It's a shimmery, shimmer art, I think. Fine, it's a bead. Apparently the Division can track you as long as they have any of your personal items. So our heroes go to a very powerful sniffer played by Ming-Na Wen? From ER? Yes, she's also the voice of Mulan, but more importantly, she's... Yes, she can kick my ass into a whole new shape any day. So our heroes use ming -Na's info to find Kira. And guess what? Nick and Kira know each other. In fact, they used to be an item. 
Well, it's a good thing that this movie is based on a totally original comic book. Otherwise, I would fall under the impression that they were ripping off everything ever written! So now that Nick found Kira and the key that will lead them to the case, and wait a minute, is Dakota Fanning trying to act like she's drunk? This 10 year old. I'm 13, and I am powering my youth. <laughs> Hold it in. Hold it in. So now that Nick has the girl and the key, his big plan is to confront the division? With great power. What's the point? Let's just skip this. So aside from the fact that after 10 years, Nick looks like a grown-up, all the while Carver looks exactly the same, Nick, who can barely control his powers, is now taking on the most powerful metahuman catching organization in the world. Yeah, this ends pretty much as well as you would expect. <laughs> While the severe beating of Nick is taking place, Carver goes outside to talk to Cassie. And Dakota Fanning does what she does best. Cry on cue! Bella chose Edward over Jacob. So after they beat up Nick for a little bit, they let him go. Beat him up to an inch of his life, then let him go. I'll get you next time, catch it. Oh, but the plot thins, as Carver reveals that Kira was actually an agent of the Division and that she volunteered for the procedure. So why did she lose her memory? And why did she hide the case? And why did she engineer an elaborate escape before she was injected with the serum? I told you to stop asking perfectly logical questions, you foolish fool! Did I just punch myself? Nick figures out that the Division can't track them if they themselves don't know what they are going to do. So he leaves his pal's letters with instructions and then he has his memory wiped. But how will Nick know what to do? I knew that you knew that I knew that you knew that I knew Okay. So it's time for the final battle and <laughs> Okay, I'm okay. So Nick gears up for the final confrontation, and if you're hoping to see that awesome telekinetic moment from the posters, then you're in for some big fucking disappointment. <laughs> things with his mind is his actual power. I think his power is extreme luck. So it turns out that what was in the case was the super soldier serum. You mean the serum that you made yourselves? You couldn't make more? Ah, fuck it. So it comes down to Nick versus Carver in the ultimate super powered battle to avenge his father's life and- wait a minute. Carver's power is mind control? So what happened at the beginning of the movie was- Kill yourself. Okay. Wait a minute, how did he counteract Carver's mind control powers? Ah, screw it, the fight is on. Wow, he killed himself to save everybody from a serum that was going to enhance their power. Wait, what? Never mind. Point is, he valiantly sacrificed himself. Psych! He's still alive. In fact, everything that happened was an elaborate ruse to fool the division orchestrated by Cassie's mother. You know, that character that was never in the movie? Yup, that one. And what exactly did Cassie's prophecy of her and Nick dying mean? <laughs> Who knows? And why exactly did the division need to keep this asshole alive to find the only white girl in all of Hong Kong? <laughs> Don't know. And what was Ming Na's part in Nick's super duper plan? Nothing! Absolutely nothing! But that's not all. Nick miraculously gave Cassie an envelope revealing to her that they did know each other beforehand and that she was never an agent for the division. Put your gun in your mouth. Pull the trigger. So the villain, who was played by the best actor in the movie, was killed off camera. I promise never to use my powers unless it was completely necessary. But I stands like it stands, and I can't stands no more. I'm going bionic! Bionic, bionic! reason 
gonna hide in here forever. I should go upstairs. This movie's a monstrous and mischievous mess, and the worst thing about it is that it's so forgettable. In fact, wait a minute, I forgot what I was gonna say. I'm forgetting the whole movie. Holy shit, I gotta write this down. Check out my website, suckers! <laughs>